Hi hey guys, uh, welcome to Philosophy 103. Um, today we'll be talking about Plato's Metaphysics. This is our first uh, recorded lecture, um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so once you've listened to this lecture, please um, come to our group discussion in class where we'll talk for uh, an hour to an hour and a half about um, this theme. So, so as I'm going through this lecture, as I uh, as I'm doing this lecture rather, please write down your questions um, and your thoughts, and uh, bring them up in our group discussion. So, what do we mean when we say metaphysics? Um, this is in the book. We we and this is a good little just intro of um, language terminology. Um, before uh, this lecture and for the next on Aristotle's metaphysics. So metaphysics is uh, very often called uh, the science of being qua being, being as being. Um, and the question here is, of course, what what are all the thing, uh, things in being, what do they all share in common? So what is what unifies a, a chair and a thought, right? What do these th two things that exist in reality hold in common that they might exist in the same world together, right? What is it in being that unifies all the diversity and plurality of, of the things in this world? This being, qua being, is going to be more of a, a terminology we use when we get to Aristotle. All right, so it won't be, we, we won't be talking about it in this lecture, um, in this language. Um, similarly, the essence or nature of things. This is an Aristotelian terminology, metaphysical terminology as well. And 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 the question would go, you know, what are the essence essences of things? What is the nature of things? Whether humans, horses, um, um, chairs. What what are what what is the nature of all these things? You know, certain things have what would seem pretty fixed natures. You know, it would hard to be hard be hard to argue about the nature of a banana. It seems like it's a fruit that grows, you peel it, and monkeys eat it. Whereas uh, uh, the form of a chair, pretty fixed nature. Uh, it would be bizarre for anyone to car uh, build a chair um, that wasn't meant for sitting sitting on. Though I believe the Shakers made some interesting chairs upon which only angels could sit, so... Maybe, so maybe there's an argument there, but but the idea is it's pretty. They're for sitting, right? Whereas you come to a human being, and um, and, and and very often this becomes more of an argument. What is the nature of a human being? What is our nature? It seems a little bit more up for grabs than um, other more fixed standard natures. Uh, a horse is walking in within two hours of coming out of of being born and seems to live right into an immediate instinctive nature. Whereas humans, it seems we have to talk about it and work it out and uh, discern what our desires are in this life. And that has a lot to do with how we understand ourselves and how we disagree about what essences are in human nature. Um, if there were an essence, you might say, oh, we'll get into this with Aristotle. Uh, the forms of things. So now we're, we're, we're veering more into um, uh, language we'll see in Platonic metaphysics. So the forms of things. Um, Aristotle uses that language too. So uh, asks, asks the question, what is accidental to our nature and what is formal to our nature? What is What, 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 what can come and go and what is somewhat more of a... Um, formal property that, 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 that is permanent to our nature, um, that is necessary uh, to call, you know, that is necessary. Um, so let me use an example. So, you know, whether I have brown hair or red hair, you could change this to all different kinds of colors, but I'll still remain a human being, right? I'll still rem remain J, a human being, right? My formal quality of what makes me human remains in spite of the fact that my hair color changes or perhaps I lose a couple fingers right you don't you still don't have any um, difficulty in perceiving what my formal quality is which is a human being right so uh, question is what is accidental and what is formal right 
now we'll get into this more. You know, I, I could you we, we might say that fing five fingers or ten fingers, ten toes, four appendages, um, whatever it might be, are all formal qualities of being a human of of, of, of the human being. Um, Yet, if I were missing any one of those, or maybe a few of those, you would still might recognize me as a human. So it, it might even go uh, deeper, um, and we might not be able to come to a um, an agreement on what is accidental to our nature. Um, so we'll come into this with Plato. When we say the good, or the true, or the beautiful, or even love, do we mean something in physical reality that we can touch and hold? This is a question metaphysics asks. Are truth and beauty and love are these things? Uh, do they are, are these things are, are these ideas false? Do they not exist in that we can't hold them? Um, relations between things, interconnection, the one and the many. This is uh, these are other themes of metaphysics, the one and the many, um, which is kind of like being as being, right? What is that th that, that that thing in reality that unifies all things? Um, all the many diverse multiple things in this world what is some what can we describe as the one unifying thing that brings those all that holds them all in the same world together um, what is a commonality between all things for many metaphysics has roots in uh, and can be said to be synonymous with spiritual experience now this 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 was true for plato and aristotle though they weren't necessarily explicitly using language like spiritual experiences in this case. Um, and it's true today. And uh, if you go to Bantam Books, I think that's the bookstore on 4th Avenue there, on your way out to UBC. If you go to the metaphysics section, you might not even find Plato or Aristotle. You'll find a bunch of California gurus who are, who are uh, talking about metaphysics um, in a much different way, but yet it is still a, a discussion of what precedes or is simultaneous with, or subtends, physical reality. Okay. So why metaphysics? Um, a good question and a perennial question is: What is the use of metaphysics? Metaphysics can be deceptive. It can give you a picture of the world that you haven't actually seen or witnessed empirically. It could make you an ideologue, right? You can make you be, feel certain of things no human has actually seen. Metaphysics is by nature beyond physical and therefore invisible to the eye, right? It's not something we see in itself. Um, Socrates, for instance, was a moral philosopher. In real life, he didn't employ metaphysics when he spoke, when he conversed with people. Many suppose that the world of the ideas, and, and I am assuming you guys all understand what I mean by that, having read the text, and we'll go into it more deeply. Um, many suppose that the world of the ideas was strictly Plato's invention. Why did Plato feel the need to go beyond moral reasoning? So what I'm saying there is Socrates never had uh, this particular view, we can pretty much say. There's other... Um, writers of Socratic dialogues. Plato wasn't the only one. The, 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 perhaps the next most well-known is Xenophon. And in Xenophon's text, there was never this uh, notion of ideas and forms in, in the real non-fictional Socrates in the Agora in Athens, talking to people on the street, you know. Um, so we can say by cross-referencing Plato with Xenophon, that it didn't that these this looks like an invention of Plato, an idea of Plato's that that's given voice through his Socratic character. Um, so why did Plato feel the need to go beyond moral reasoning, just moral working out what was good, you know, like um, like like uh, Socrates Socrates does with Credo in the dialogue we read last week, where where um, um, Plato doesn't bring up any sort of really uh, abstract metaphysics to understand uh, just working out on our own um, what the good is in a situation. So one answer, uh, one answer to why we feel, feel we might need to go beyond moral reasoning is because moral reasoning, if we take it as far as it can go, 
seems to indicate that there is more to this world than meets the eye. Why do we wish to do good by our neighbor? Why do we make beautiful things? Why is so Im what, what is so important about truth? Why couldn't we just lie all the time? Right? There seems to see something something beyond. You know, no one it was never written in stone on your or written on the side of your crib when you were a baby, always tell the truth, always be good to folks. You know, this is something we um we feel called to do. Now, we might argue that this is pu purely cultural and maybe a maybe a, a mere societal habit, but we see it rather commonly spring up in all societies. There is a, a sense of virtue and goodness between, um, between citizens um, that perhaps can't be entirely reduced to, uh, what is it, the superego, the, um, you know, your mother's voice in your head always telling you, be good to someone else. There seems something intrinsically of value to each one of us that goes beyond just having been told this. Or taught this um, and what is that what is that what, what are we responding to you know when we see someone do a good action when we ourselves feel good for doing a good action um, when we're inspired to do good actions by others um, so a common perception of morality today is that it is all in our heads an evolutionary function or something conditioned in us problematic notions as we'll see later but for Plato goodness truth and beauty were Ontological. Now, what do I mean by that? Ontological means um, uh, the study of being is ontology. So when I say ontological, something rooted in being itself. Um, so the true, the good, and the beautiful, they are a part of being. They're knitted into the fabric of reality. They're not just opinions in our heads. They are, um, they are things outside us and within us and something that constitutes the world in a, in a way perhaps uh, more deeply, radically rooted than the atoms, the subatomic particles, etc., etc., that also weave together the fabric of the world. And I'm not calling truth, goodness, and beauty, of course, something material like those things. I'm saying, I'm saying there's something metaphysical, perhaps, that stands and subtends all this, all this other reality that we do perceive with our eyes. Um, So the good precedes all being for Plato. The moral universe is the primordial universe. Okay? So if there's a one and a many, perhaps we could call the one the good. And all the things that emerge from the good, all the things we know and see and feel, etc., etc. And it all springs out of the good. Um, now you might have arguments for that, but again, I am uh, while I'm presenting a philosophy that that I think is, is strong, and though I might myself have um, certain um, uh, points to nitpick about it, um, I think this is a very attractive and strong philosophy and lays the backbone for a very strong philosophical tradition um, that we call the perennial tradition. Okay, so the pre-Socratics, uh, as we've gone over, uh, Plato and Aristotle both attempted to resolve the problems they inherited from these guys to find the ultimate substance of the universe, to understand what was eternal and unchanging, right? And if you recall, Thales thought this ultimate substance was water. Heraclitus thought it was fire, and that everything was in eternal flux. And though we were a little bit, we got into Heraclitus more deeper, that's to kind of reduce him to a somewhat of a lazy definition there of what he, what he thought. As we recall, he was a lot more exciting than that. Um, uh, so everyone was trying to explain um, what was eternal and unchanging. Parmenides said this whole world was illusory. All the unchanging you see is actually just uh, an illusion, a fiction that you that you we all mistakenly perceive. Really, the world has to be seen with reason, not our eyes. And reason tells us that actually nothing changes, right? And we can take that with, uh, you know, there is no... There is no, again, to, re to review just briefly, there is no between for him. Either, either there is being or there is nothing, right? You can't be in the middle. So if there is no such thing as nothing, if we can't even think it, and we've never even seen such a, a vacuum, um, even a vacuum is a something, right? <laughs> um, 
then then all must be right um, so these were the different ways that these pre-Socratics explained this uh, conundrum of change and, uh, and, and changelessness. Um, and De De Democritus of Gand, we, we know, um, it was Adams. Um, note that this material conception of reality leaves us... So with Democritus too, we get the question of, um, and even with Thales, uh, with Democritus, Thales, and Anaximenes, and Anaximander, we get, um, we still are left with the question because they were materialists. So note that this material conception of reality leaves us with the question, well then, what made the atoms? This is another reason we journey into metaphysics, um, precisely because such materialist understand understandings aren't satisfying to reason, right? There's always that you know, my, my kids are in that phase right now. You know, well, then what came before that? What came before that? Well, who made God? Well, who made God? Well, who made him? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there, there, there is something about, uh, particularly about material um, reality that that is, uh, isn't satisfying. Again, it, material reality can't explain existence because matter already exists, right? It hasn't explained itself. Um, so for Plato, uh, the forms or ideas, okay, well, we, 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 uh, what does the book stick with? The, with um, I think it's the forms more often. So we'll be talking about the forms more so, but, but know that these two um, are, are synonymous. And in Greek, it's eidos, so it sounds more like ideas, but we'll, I think we use forms more often here. Um, particularly, too, because uh, Aristotle goes on and uses the, the term as forms. Um, when he agrees and disagrees with Plato's ideas, he uses form quite often, so it's consistent with him, so it helps out. Um, so what is eternal and unchanging for Plato? Uh, what is eternal and unchanging for Plato are what he calls forms or ideas. Not ideas in our minds, but ideal forms or perfect examples. Um, the perfect circle or perfect beauty or perfect good, etc. Um, in his notion of the forms, Plato brings together, indeed synthesizes, Parmenides' conception of the world as changeless and Heraclitus' conception of the world as absolute flux. Um, now, I, I don't want to jump too deep into Heraclitus again, but we remember that Heraclitus was more interesting than that because he already sort of expressed a permanency and a flux. In his own thinking. He wasn't just pure flux, as you recall. But for the sake of argument, let's say that Plato brings together these ideas. Heraclitus wasn't, uh, he only have fragments of what he spoke of, so we don't know the depth of his philosophy. So Plato is trying to bring this to a, a greater realization, trying to bring these things into a, a synthesis. Changeless, uh, what is changeless? He's trying to bring what is flux, what is in flux, and what is constant and eternal and changeless um, into some coherence together. How? In Platonic metaphysics, there are two worlds. One, the world in which we live, a world of constant chains or a world of becoming. And two, a world of forms, an unchanging world, the real world or the world of being. Okay, so we have becoming and we have being. Um, becoming always sort of moving towards being. Uh, becoming being a, a, a lesser world than complete perfect being. Okay, and being itself is, is it's in itself perfection and completeness. And we're not there yet. We're all becoming. Everything in this world is sort of becoming. Now we'll explain more how this is synthesized in the next slide. So being, these are the qualities of being, changeless and eternal, uh, world of perfection, um, the only changeless, uh, only the changeless can be truly known, like as Parmenides would say, only access to this world through reason, our capacity for intellectual thought. So it's the only access to this world through reason, our capacity for intellectual thought. Um, becoming, this is always changing, in flux, living, dying. Um, exists in time. It's temporal. It's not permanent. It's the world of opinion, 
right? Not of necessarily of pure knowledge. World of opinion where certain truth cannot be absolutely attained. Um, recall Socrates, I only know that I know nothing. This will always be implicit in Plato's metaphysics, even when it seems like Plato is shooting for total certainty in his theory. Remember that a lot of the a lot of the, uh, the the underlying theme a lot of the time is that I know that I don't know everything. I know that I don't know the things that are most worth knowing. You know, what is goodness? What is truth? What is beauty? What is love? What is virtue? All these sorts of things. Um, so the symposium uh, passage... Um, in, in the book, this it talks about loving eros, and we talked about this in our in our first um, oh in, yeah in our introductory lecture. Eros for Plato suggests a natural desire or love in us that moves towards the beautiful, the true, and the good. It is our natural desire to move toward the forms, right? Becoming, moving toward the better and the ultimately perfect. In this light, we are becoming, moving toward our pre perfection, moving toward being, right? So again, we're not in being yet. We are, we are merely becoming. Okay. Now, in a sort of way, you know, Parmenides would argue there could be no such thing as becoming, right? Uh, because this uh, this would imply um, some kind of nothingness, where things are lost, where in time we change, and change means that things aren't permanent. Indeed, that they change means that they're temporal. So that we're implicitly implying that there's a nothingness at hand. Um, so how can it be that becoming and being can exist in the same world, right? So here we're, we're stating that becoming is a sort of a middle point, an in-between, something between the eternal and nothingness, something between being and nothingness, this becoming. Well, Plato says, and here we go get into that there's this thing called participation, right? Where in becoming, we are not entirely detached from being. We are a part of being. We are within being, but we are participating in it, right? Um, so let's read and make perhaps make this understanding more clear. For Plato's, uh, from Plato's Symposium, and this is in the textbook, beauty is not anywhere in another thing as in an animal, or in earth, or in heaven. Here we're talking about the form of beauty. Or in anything else, but itself by itself, with itself. It is always one in form. And all the other beautiful things share in that, in such a way that when those others come to be, or pass away, this does not become the least bit smaller or greater, nor suffer any change. So in this world of becoming, where things are beautiful, we participate in this greater form of beauty. We never know beauty in its perfection. We can't imagine it. We can't fathom it. If you're using some sort of image to represent it in your mind right now, you're already crossing the line. We know beauty not because it nakedly appears in things itself that are beautiful. Rather, beauty is a universal we each perceive in things. Right? And we don't always agree, of course, in this world of becoming and of opinion, after all, on what is and what isn't beautiful. But we all know what beauty means, even if we all resist having the same um, opinions on what beauty is. When I tell you that this loud punk music that I love is beautiful... Um, Maybe there's even objective arguments against that. I don't know. But let's say there's beautiful punk music. I say it's beautiful. You might not think so, but you know what I mean, right? Because you know what I'm talking about. You know beauty, right? Because we have, we, 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 even if we think all the things in this world are um, differently beautiful, we don't agree on any of them, we still somewhat know, we, we still agree on there, there being beauty in the world, right? Um, so what is that beauty? So beauty is a universal we each perceive in things, a spiritual experience we all know. For Plato, beauty doesn't subsume the things themselves, but instead things participate or share in beauty. The world of becoming participates or shares in beauty, in being. It shares in being. Um, 
The more beautiful something is, the closer it comes into perfection. And therefore, the closer it comes into being, the more beautiful something is. The more it shares in the form of beauty, the more it becomes itself and moves toward being, perfect being, right? And indeed, we could say it the other way around. Perhaps um, the less we share, uh, if we wanted to oppose Parmenides, the less we share in this perfect beauty or perfect goodness or perfect truth, the less we share in this, the more we move away from being, perfect being, towards nothingness, right? So in a way, we have our own fates in our hands. We either move towards and pursue being and perfection and truth, good, etc., or we slide away, right? And we move towards nothing. So we have a lot of uh, agency now in Plato that we might not have in Parmenides, right? Um, where the world's just a sort of a drunken, strange illusion and and reality lies on the other side and we can see it once in a while with our reason. Here we have more um, uh, an active, uh, practical participation in metaphysics here, we can say, where we are ourselves choose by virtue or the lack thereof um, how we are going to live our life and participate or not participate in these greater truths of being that, that again, are the foundations of the reality we inhabit. Okay, so the myth of the cave. Um, this is probably uh, well known to some of you. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you've just heard someone say something about it. Maybe you've seen movies like The Matrix or, oh, there's like a, are they called The Broods or The Roods? There's some sort of Steve Carell movie with a bunch of cavemen in it, uh, some one of those uh, DreamWorks films. that So that and the Matrix actually use the uh, the illusion, the, the metaphor of the cave, the myth of the cave, um, in those movies themselves. And remember in the Matrix, he's sort of stuck in, um, he's brought out of um, his fictional world that's just really a computer program, and all of a sudden sees another world, etc., um, now, it's not exactly the same, but that's what they were going for. They were going for this Plato's myth of the cave. And essentially, um, and here I put a few photos of the, or pictures of the cave because it's, it's always, it, it's funny because it, it's only ever been stated by Plato. Um, and he describes it in a couple of his, in the Republic and a couple of other, his other um, dialogues. And I like what, looking at pictures because people always sort of present it in a slightly different way, never exactly the same, um, because the script description isn't always entirely clear. I mean, I, I think he mentions in one dialogue that there's little, strange, human-like creatures that are moving the puppets up behind the wall in front of the in front of the fire, um, and in others, it's uh, it's just normal human beings walking around with the puppets. In any case. Not not an important point, just uh, uh, just interesting. So Plato's myth of the cave. Um, this is a parable about bringing people into greater participation with the forms, bringing them from the less real to the more real, from becoming to being. Okay, an emphasis on the love of wisdom is at root here in in this myth of the cave, the irresistibility irresistibility of what is fundamentally real is thematic. The myth of the cave not only illustrates two kinds of knowledge, two kinds of worlds, it is also a parable about human timidity, the difficulties we have in facing the truth, and our resistance to the dazzling light of truth itself. So Socrates, uh, let's just take one um, quotation from, uh, it was in your textbook, um, I think I believe he quotes the Republic to, um, to speak of the, play, uh, the cave myth. Um, yes, it's the Republic. Um, Whether it, that is the world of forms, is true or not, only the God knows, but this is how I see it, Socrates speaking here. Namely, that in the intelligible world, the form of the good is the last to be seen, and with difficulty. 
When seen, it must be reckoned to be, for all the cause of all that is, right and beautiful, to have produced in the visible world both the light and the fount of light, while in the intelligible world it is itself that which produces and controls truth and intelligence, and he who is to act intelligently in public or private must see it, must see the form of the good. So I'm not going to strip this down. It's 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 a it's a rich, dense little quote. But two points I want to take from it. Um, first, note the provisional character of Socrates' metaphysical proposal of reality here. Whether the world of forms is true or not, only the God knows. Right? Um, it, when I say it's provisional, it's it, we have to. It, it means it, it 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 it'll do for now until we can come up with a better understanding. So he's holding, while he sees these things, let's not, I'm not going to say he doesn't see these things as mm, in some way move the best case explanation we can make. He thinks he's making that, right? He's not just throwing anything out in the air, but he's willing to listen out, li listen to others who can um, perhaps present a, a richer description of how we describe our relationship and our participation in goodness, truth, and beauty, and all that. Um, <clears throat> second point, the form of the good here is not something we need to reach into the sky to find, right? As much as the myth of the cave makes it seem super abstract and strange. It is the very thing we perceive or fail to perceive when acting intelligently in the public or private sphere, as it says there, right? In the Credo, for example, the character of Credo himself is in the cave, he himself, we could put in the cave. We could give him this. We could put this metaphor to explain his whole response to the situation that Socrates is in, you know, the day before his execution and all that. Um, we could put Credo himself in the cave, seeking the form of the good in order to know how to act justly. Yet he fails over and over because he is operating in the shadows of his anxiety, turned away from the light. Right. So the cave isn't, you know. Big Brother, necessarily, or, you know, Donald Trump's uh, lies or whatever it might be, um, the cave is perhaps much more fundamental to the individual. Um, though we, we, we could take it to those higher levels, too. But we have to begin here, I would, I think, Plato would argue, um, that we have to begin with ourselves. What, what darkens our eyes? What turns us away from... Um, from the shadows to see the sun, right? And and Creed, I know, is precisely, um, and it's precisely um, Socrates who 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 attempts. Remember, the Socratic therapy. He tr seeks to shepherd Crito away out of his anxieties and fears and to the form of the good, towards the right, just action, right? Um, so it's not just again. Uh, some astral cosmic vision of the forms here. We're talking about what happens between us when we speak, when we chat, when we try to work out between each other um, what the good is, right? What's good? What's the right action? Now, why is such resistance from the prisoner to look toward the truth? So Plato's metaphysics are bound to an ethics, and I think we're already starting to see that, I hope. Um, Therefore, metaphysics and ethics go hand in hand for Plato. The perfection of the forms confronts, confronts me with the moral truth I either accept or that I reject. The good is the form hardest to see, but only through seeing the good do we recognize what is beautiful and right in the world. Right. So again, Credo, uh, looking for the good looking for the form of the good in that conversation there. There was an ethical, a deeply ethical activity, and we can explain it in some ways and give it greater clarity when we put it in this sort of metaphysical, um, give it metaphysical clarity in a way, even if it's provisional. So if I accept, if I accept it, I share or further participate in the good. If I refuse the good, I fall further into my own shadow, backwards in my own becoming because of fear, anxiety, pride, arrogance, etc. Note too that the freed prisoner, once seeing the sun itself, feels bound to return to free the other prisoners, 
even if it ultimately leads to his doom. To see the good is simultaneous with the need to share this knowledge with others, at whatever risk, right? So to see that form of the good uh, forces that prisoner to go back down, right? And suffer potentially death and execution and um, uh, persecution, um, uh, despite it. Because the form of the good uh, it triggers us to want to share that with others and to share this luminous understanding of the world and light up other minds to get them out of their caves, right? And this is particularly who Socrates is. He is that prisoner. He's gone back down to show Crito, to show Glaucon, to show many others what, where the light is and help them redirect their eyes. And this is his mission and goal, right? Um, for if he weren't to do that, then he wouldn't have actually seen the form of the good because the very form of the good inspires us to go on and do this because it is the form of the good to share with others, to teach, to, or to, to guide others towards the light. Teaching becomes a somewhat of a hard term, and we'll see that in a second. Education, therefore, becomes a central theme to the myth of the cave. But what is education? In Plato's dialogue, Mino, Socrates confounds the idea of learning. What does it mean to learn? Socrates had taught his students, Plato among them, that the truth, if we can know it at all, must be in us. Must be in us. The truth, if we can know it all, must be in us. In a way, we already know the things. We already have knowledge of all the things of this world. <laughs> If you want to make it more complicated, there you go. This is what's called Mino's Paradox, not to be mistaken for Zeno's Paradox. And Zeno's Paradox is the one uh, Parmenides, uh, one of Parmenides' students, the one we talked about um, in the pre-Socratic lecture. So Mino's Paradox, how is it possible to learn anything? If we don't already know it, how will we recognize it when we find it? And if we already do know it, it makes no sense to say that we learn it. So if we don't already know it, how will we recognize it when we find it, right? How do we know right answers? How do we know truths? How do we, 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 we in a sense, recognize them, right? In our hearts. We, <laughs> and we'll go into deeper. Um, of course, I don't already know the color of your brother's couch over in Burnaby and how many cigarette buttholes are burnt into it. This would be information as distinct from knowledge, okay? Just mere information. For information, I would have to go out of myself to go, you know, see your brother's couch. It's purple, it's got five holes in it from cigarettes and one from hashish, <laughs> etc., etc. But knowledge, on the other hand, for Plato, comes from within himself, okay? Comes from within ourselves. Another difference. Knowledge is a re related to eternal, necessary truths. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a little bit more than merely my opinion. It never changes. It doesn't vary. Okay, so the truth is already in us. We don't need to learn anything. It's already there. Um, you already know everything. Despite the fact that you can know nothing, as Socrates says, you actually already know everything. <laughs> so what... What What's going on here? <laughs> okay, how do we know everything and not know anything at all at the same time? Let's see. Before we start talking about horses, as you know from the textbook, let us see where we have already sort of suggested this understanding of knowledge as something comes from, that some, of something that comes from within us. Uh, knowledge as opposed to information. So when we are attracted to the good, we are attracted to it because it speaks to something in ourselves, right? While we don't know the good in its perfection, we still know it to some degree. Otherwise, we wouldn't be attracted to it, right? Now, we don't know what truth is or, or good is entirely in itself, right? It's not like 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? Nor is it some, you know mystical creature with a cat's face and a lizard's tail like you know we we don't know what the good is but we know that we are oriented towards it right that we know so there's something in our souls that already sort of 
have some kind of preliminary understanding, right? Um, or else we wouldn't be attracted to it. We wouldn't know what it, what, what, what it was. It, it, when, we, when, when it happened in front of us, we would walk by without seeing it, right? So there's something in us that already knows what these things are, or else they'd pass right by our eye, right? When your mother, you know, when you were a baby and your mother first giggled or had a smile on her face and you giggled, you know, uh, how did you know that was funny? How did you know that was good? How did you know what was happening there was beautiful, right? There was a response in you. There was something communicated from your mother to you that you already knew in a way. It was familiar to you, whatever this goodness was. It's something you wanted to participate in, right? So it's kind of so there's some illustrations. So therefore, we have some kind of knowledge of eternal truths, even if we must claim that we do not know these eternal truths in any sort of exhaustive way, right? Again, not something with a cat face and a lizard tail standing on a mystical tree on cloud nine, the color of bright neon blue or whatever it might be. Okay, so we, we see in this... Um, we see here four different situations, right? Four it's, it's different situations that immediately strike us. There's a formal quality in each of them. Each of them is entirely different, but there's a, there's a similarity, there's a unity between all of them, right? And we see that right there, right? There's a man giving, it looks like perhaps a tourist in Mexico or something, giving a young poor girl some sandals. There is a man a Muslim man, importantly, because they're often vilified these days, a Muslim man helping, um, you know, a, an American or a Canadian lady, perhaps. There is the most adoring picture of a baby trying to wipe the tears off a woman's face on a screen that almost puts a frog in your throat, right? Um, how beautiful children can be. And there is a picture of an, uh, a man in a walker and a Wendy's. A guy making a minimum wage, holding the umbrella over his head when, you know, perhaps a low salary ought to make him miserable and just thinking about himself all day. There he is, helping someone. Um, so in these previous examples, we see four different situations. They are each their own situation. No parts of these situations are composed of the same thing, right? Every situa situation was different. Umbrellas, sandals, tissue, poverty, cold, weeping, etc. Yet for Plato, they would all profoundly share in the form of the good. And that's how we identify them, as sharing that formal quality. They were all formally good. They all were of the form of the good, participating it in it in some way. Now, what is the form of the good? Again, we don't know, but it would seem we know it to some degree in that we can identify each of these scenarios um, as, as participating in the form of the good, right? It seems we already know something about this. Okay, now horses. So similarly with horses, when we see a horse or a cow or whatever it might be, we immediately recognize an eternal form. Whoa, how? Two horses might have a thousand different accidental features. Brown or purple hair, missing legs, curly tails, etc. Yet for some reason, I will still be able to recognize the form shared between both of them. That which allows me to call them horses. Right? So imagine I was um, two years old and seeing my first horse, right? Or my first two horses. Let's say there was a purple horse and a, and, and, and a brown horse. One had three legs, one had one eye, one had no hair, a mane, one had no mane. Um, you, you know, uh, it, how, but yet I would, I would still recognize that they were both a horse. And now what is it that has me recognize that? Is there some third perfect horse that's standing between them? Well, in a sense, yes, but not in some material sense. What, Pla what, what Plato is saying is that there, we must have some sort of uh, intuition of the form of these things in order to know them, or else how do we know them? 
How do we know that they're the same thing in spite of their million differences, right? Um, so I hope that's clear. And again, we, we can go over this stuff in our um, in-class discussion uh, after you've listened to this lecture. So, so feel free to bring uh, your concerns. This is sometimes a pose, pose difficulty for many, but you know, in a way, it's just accept what Plato's saying. Just think of it like that. Um, uh, yeah, okay, whatever. We can talk about it when, when we have a discussion. Forms and definitions. The forms are what different things of the same kind have in common and what makes them things of the same kind. In other words, a form is like the definition of a thing. However, definitions are slippery things. How to define a horse, let alone the good and true? Is it because of its color? Is it its shape? Two eyes certainly aren't accidental features of a horse, nor four legs. Yet if they were missing any of these, I would still be able to recognize it for a horse, right? So we could say things are accidental, or, or we might have trouble saying what things are and aren't accidental. That a horse is born with two eyes certainly isn't an uh, accidental property. Most, we, we, we would understand horses, it would seem to be a formal property of horses to have two eyes. Yet, if one had one eye and the other had two, I would still know that they were both horses. Um, so even what we might consider a formal quality of the horse might not be there. So, so what again, what is the formal property of being a horse? Perhaps I should have to consult DNA, but then even DNA seems to know the form of a horse before a full-grown horse appears, right? Our DNA seems to know our limits, seems to grow us out into the forms as if there was a seed in there that already knew what we would be, and it gets us there. So this doesn't help us answer the question. Um, it is as though I know what a horse is already. I have an intuition of the perfect form of hoarseness, yet any kind of complete exhaustive definition eludes me. So even horses, just like goodness, truth, and beauty, their form eludes me, right? Um, in other words, every form is something we know, but also something mysterious entirely. Um, Okay, so again, I, I, I know there's problems and difficulties with this stuff, and I don't want to anticipate everybody's, because many people have different questions. Um, and I don't want to go to start anticipating too many and then confusing people with different explanations. So I'll leave it there at that simple, basic explanation. And then feel free to bring some questions on this one, and we'll, we'll challenge our understanding, on, or I'll ch challenge mine, on, on Plato's forms. So again, let's bring us back to what is learning. Now, learning for so so it would seem that this hoarseness isn't something on the horse itself. There's no formal quality. If it, even if it's missing an eye, which is a formal quality of a horse, if it's missing, if it has less than the four legs, which seems a formal quality of a horse, if it's somewhat out of shape, out of bent, has a broken back, it's this isn't a formal quality of a horse because they can all be accidental in a way. So what holds it together so that I know it's a horse? What is the permanent formal property of that thing? So for so we, we, Socrates again can't say. So what is learning? Learning for Socrates isn't learning in itself, but remembering or recollecting. I know what a horse is. I know what it formally is. And I can see two totally radically different horses and know their horse. <laughs> because I rem I, 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 I. I know their form, okay? And this is this, and here we are. This is this is the big metaphysical thrum of Platonic metaphysics. Recollection, remembering, right? We are eternal souls who through our travels through all time and space and beyond time and space have absorbed everything just by our mere eternal uh, you don't travel in eternity, in, in eternity so much as you just are in eternity. There's no movement. There's no time or anything in eternity. So this is metaphorical. But what, what he's saying is we come out of eternity and we drop down into the shadow world as souls. But having been, having, having, um, uh, uh, partaking in eternity ourselves, our souls being eternal, Plato argues, this is how we know these things, because we've been here before. 
we know all this. We have a deep understanding and knowledge of all things. As the soul is immortal, has been as as the soul is more immortal, has been born often has, and has seen all things here and in the underworld. There is nothing which it has not learned. Socrates speaking here. So it is in no way surprising that it can recollect the things it knew before, both about virtue and other things. Sorry, no, not, not Socrates talking, the textbook. As the whole of nature is akin and the soul has learned everything, nothing prevents a man, after recalling one thing only, a process men call learning, discovering everything else for himself. If he is brave and does not tire of the search, researching and learning are as a whole recollection. Um, hold on. Uh, I was a little bit thrown off there because I'm not sure if that's... Um, if that indeed is Socrates, or if that is uh, our textbook fella waxing poetical. Um, yeah, okay, no, that's the textbook talking. Um, So as we, so so our, our our purpose here in becoming, moving towards being, is to sort of remember, uh, to um, um, to, to, to to pursue knowledge, to remember it, to to recognize it, um, and that's and that's Socrates' argument, and that's how we move back towards. Our eternal being, our, our place in eternal being, is this return um, through recollection. Okay? So this might all seem like major abstraction, but the point Plato makes, whether or not you agree with his particular metaphysics, is that there is something amazing to thought that seems attuned to more than just the immediate world of sense. How do, we, how do we intuit difference and sameness in a horse or in events that are good or beautiful, uh, in a tree, in a chair? Um, how do we know the good? What is the attraction we have to truth? Why are we moved by beauty? What does this all say about us? What are we intuiting? What do our souls already seem to know or seem to be attuned to? So here, a final caveat that I like to make with Plato is, again, we must remember, as we stressed in the Crito, that Plato wasn't writing philosophical doctrines. Um, they were provisional, uh, it, which isn't to say he didn't think that they were the best explanation thus far. In other dialogues, Plato allows his interlocutors, the people he's talking to, that's what interlocutors means, to cast his metaphysics of the forms into question, sometimes even confounding Socrates in his defense of them. Um, unlike Aristotle and perhaps most of the philosophical tradition, Plato's dialogues are also art, poetry, and drama. Now why is this important to consider? Sorry, I've got a big truck outside my window right now, making a lot of noise. I hope that's not disturbing you and hope you can hear me. I think this is important to consider because we go beyond ideology, right? Why, why do we consider Plato more broadly uh, for his ideas, certainly, because Socrates and Plato, uh, the ideas shared in those dialogues were strong ideas, right? However strange and mystical they might seem. They were solid ideas trying to explain something that we certainly haven't explained. But we want to take it uh, that we certainly in our scientific modern day have not explained in any satisfying way. Um, but we don't want to, uh, but if we, we take them more broadly, um, we can consider them more than just an, a single idea. We can, we can consider them more as just ideological pieces where Plato is just trying to get his ideas across to you. The central point of the Platonic dialogues have to do with human interaction, with dialogue. Plato might hold his metaphysical convictions loosely, but this doesn't mean that his conviction isn't that we are moved to the true and the good. It certainly is. He believes that. Whatever explanations we can come up with, um, that those are the nature of the of the of the dialogues themselves. That's the common ground we need to stand on 
to speak, is that there is beauty and goodness that we were not going to move to justice through injustice and all that. Those are impasses. We need some common ground, and that is that. Um, and it is in relationship and conversation that this truth and goodness unfolds. What Plato is trying to represent is the spirit of philosophy, philosophy in its highest form, the sometimes messy dance of a moving and living dialogue between the respectful and loving human beings. Okay, I think that, that caps it off. Um, okay, guys, so uh, I will see you later for uh, our discussion group on this stuff. All right, talk soon.